All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, hello. Uh, welcome to City of Squatters, um, a lecture performance by Simon Leong. Um, my name is Lindsay Burfond. Um, I'm an assistant curator at Queens Museum. Um, I, I'm gonna do a quick visual description. I'm a white Jewish American woman in my early thirties with brown hair and a bun and glasses. Um, I'd like to take these first few moments for a land recognition. Um, Queens Museum is located in Flushing Meadows Corona Park in central Queens. Um, in, we would like to acknowledge the Muncie Lenape, Canarsie, Lakawe, Rockaway, and Matinecock communities as stewards of the land and their past, present, and future generations. As both a museum of art and a historic site built on unceded indigenous lands, Queen's Museum recognizes the continual displacement of native people by the United States and is committed to working to dismantle the ongoing effects of this colonial legacy. Queen's Museum stands with all those advancing indigenous resurgence and decolonization. We honor and pay respect to the indigenous knowledge bearers that have, have and continue to live in deep connection to the land. We invite you all to take action now by devoting time to taking care of the land, whether this be cleaning up your local park or donating to an indigenous led advocacy group. Um, and with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Larissa Harris for an introduction, thank you. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? I hope you can. Um, my name is Larissa Harris. Um, thank you, Lindsay. Thank you so much. Um, my visual description is um, I'm, I've got, um, I'm a white woman with short, dark brown hair and a big scarf. Um, I'm the curator of After the Plaster Foundation or Where Can We Live, which is an exhibition of 12 artists dealing in different ways with displacement. The exhibition is on view at the Queens Museum through February 28th. So from the very beginning of working on the show, I knew that Simon Lung's work with Warren Nieslahowski, the writer, translator, raconteur, and perpetual guest who touched so many of us during his brilliant peripatetic life, that that work would be at the core of the exhibition. Then the writer and editor, Lara Hoffman, kindly introduced me to Simon. Um, and I learned about his squatting projects for the first time. How these projects have dealt with his own experience as an immigrant to the US from Hong Kong, I won't explicate here, but we'll let Simon elaborate. Uh, he and I had many conversations um, about how to include this body of work in the show. And finally, we went with a new performance, which with COVID upon us, has morphed into this online artist talk today. Titled City of Squatters, it brings Warren's experience together with the squatting projects in the broader context of Simon's work and the experience of our world today, that, un un that experience for which there are no words. Um, so Simon wanted to wait until 2020 was over to complete this talk. Uh, so I am in as much of a state of anticipation as the rest of you. Um, on view now in Warsaw at the Foxhall Gallery Foundation is, and Warren Nieslahowski was there, guest, host, ghost. Organized by Sina Najafi and Joanna Varsha, this is a tribute to Warren Nieslahowski in the form of an exhibition and book. The exhibition includes many artworks inspired by him, and I hope we can consider this one among them. This is the show's last day in Warsaw, but it will, we hope, be coming to New York City in the spring. Um, a little bit of a bio for Simon. Simon is a Hong Kong-born artist living in New York and Los Angeles. His foremost concern, as he says, as an artist is how the ethical, broadly defined, can be thought and traced. His work has been exhibited internationally over the last 30 years. And now just a few housekeeping notes. Please be aware this event is being recorded. Um, after the talk, we will take some questions. Please enter those in the Q&A feature. And now, Simon, I hand it over to you. Thanks, Larissa. Um, I wanna thank Larissa, Sophia, and Lindsay. The name you see here when you 
look at the screen or when you hover the cursor over my face in a minute is an indexical reminder of the colonization of the city of my birth, Hong Kong. My given name is common in many parts of the world once brought under the dominion of the British Empire. It is a name officially registered as my legal name on the certificate of my birth in a language that was not the native tongue of either of my parents in what was once a city of refuge. My surname is translated from Cantonese. Its spelling standardized under the convention of 19th century British rule. I'm a stain sighted on the surface of the screen. At times, I may appear as a model abstraction. At times, I may resemble a dark spot, a silhouette thrown against light caught in a grid. At times, I may be a miracle image. The Tongva people were once the steward of this land from which I signal, a city which is now, according to FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, the most dangerous area of the more than 3,000 counties surveyed in the United States. I am hosted across the continent on the land of Munsin, Lenape, Kanarsi, Lakawi, Rockaway, and Matankok peoples under the auspices of a museum in a borough named in the late 1600s after an English queen. This institution is joined across the Atlantic Ocean by another which comes to its last days of exhibiting traces of Warren Niswohoski, my late friend, who even before his death was already at once guest, host, and ghost, in a city that was mostly destroyed during the Second World War, but was rebuilt like a scar over a wound to resemble as much as possible the city before its destruction in a country that squatted under the sovereignty of neighboring powers for over a hundred years across two centuries. Between you and me and the satellites and receptors are other incalculable histories of other people, places, and beings. I am wearing what was worn by a squatting figure against a white background in a poster produced and distributed in Berlin in 1994. A hooded sweatshirt turned inside out without the hood over my head, dark pants and black leather shoes that are identical to the shoes worn 27 years ago. The shoes were chosen as a signifier of incongruity with the rest of the squatter's clothing, as if what the squatter wears is attesting to the makeshift moment of his being. This does not belong with that. On 500 of the thousand posters, an additional text surrounded the figure in German. Proposal, imagine a city of squatters, a city in which everyone created their own chairs with their own bodies. Two, 
when you are tired or when you need to wait. Participate in this position. Three, observe the city again from this squatting position. The room I speak from is rented. I have never owned property. On the evening of March 13, a Friday in 2020, I embodied and answered to nobody. In an evening devoted to the interpretation of the pronouns by Jackson McLaurin. Earlier, I received an email informing me that the Queen's Museum would close that day out of an abundance of caution for at least one week due to the current situation concerning COVID-19. That the opening for after the Plaster Foundation is postponed and that the situation will be reevaluated week by week. What time is it there? Photographs of a Cantonese opera troupe in early 20th century, taken not long after the two year pandemic of 1918, almost disappeared entirely. The remnants from May's photography studio in San Francisco being thrown out, but they were salvaged because someone thought what thought we should know their history. Do they know our history? Do they know the cadence of our fever? What is the use of art before the people, before a synchronized being to synchronize themselves with its order of time, to tell the time of the viewer's life as a fragment of this image? We know theater to be the word to describe battle. For example, the theater in the Pacific. What lies on either side of the Pacific. What sovereigns? What rough beasts? Someone in a tree, what do they see? The symmetry lull us into the time of death, the beauty of violence. Before the law, are they fugitives or are they seeking refuge? Who fears imprisonment and separation? When a coffin moves across the stage. When a tomb is placed at its center. Long live the Republic. They wave flags in their attack. The traitor downstage. If they tie him up, what will they do next? They bring the guillotine. They breach the interior. In the mayhem, they are difficult to identify. So names need to be pinned to the person, the proper name, the author function. They speak of sedition in the land in which I was born and in the land in which I live. 
but where can you live? The job of the backdrop is to dream the actors, to compel the people before it so strongly with a two-dimensional argument that it has hallucinates surface as space, cajoling time to collapse onto an illusion of depth. Moving forward, one, two, three, entering its arches on our own steam, four, five, before being blocked by the gate on the other side of the passageway. Is it understood that the skulls lining the aperture gaze in unity? Or do we imagine the flesh that lived on each as being individuated as our own? 19, 20, 21. There is death, but even in death, there is no rest. In 1795, Immanuel Kant publishes Perpetual Peace. Perpetual Peace. Whether this satirical inscription on a Dutch innkeeper's sign upon which a burial ground was painted had for its object mankind in general or the rulers of states in particular who are insatiable of war or merely the philosophers who dream this sweet dream. It is not for us to decide. For Kant, the addressees, interpretations, and uses of this phrase may vary, but the image of a final place of rest was enough of an anchor to anchor perpetually to modify peace. After two decades, I realized what I was looking at was simply to picture a place to rest. But that was already 10 years ago. City of Squatters is a limited exercise in self-appropriation. In some cases, re-saying what I've already said for the sake of time, I've limited the squatting projects to those undertaken in the last century, and Warren carries us into this one. Squatting Through Violence, 1995. Many years ago, my younger brother told me in passing an anecdote which I remember to this day. He was probably 12 or 13, waiting for the bus in the suburban city where we grew up with a few other people whom he took to be Vietnamese immigrants. What struck him about this otherwise innocuous moment and perhaps what located the foreignness of these strangers for him was the position of their bodies while they were waiting. They were squatting. Although they were not squatting to call attention to themselves, that was exactly the effect as they rested their underassimilated Asian bodies in a habitual position of waiting, incongruous with the sun-bathed sidewalks of a California suburb. What rendered this particularly unusual seemed to my young brother's eyes, so much so that he told me about it, was the fact that the bus stop provided seats, which remained empty while these strangers squatted, waiting. In Les Techniques du Corps, an essay dated from 1934, Marcel Mauss made the often quoted ethnographic assertion that humanity can be divided into those who squat and those who sit. What sort of statement is this? Is it a replay? of the Enlightenment morphology, which schematically represents Western humanity as upright and historical, while others are base and subservient, living in timeless savagery. Given ethnography's obsession with racial classification, 
including precisely the difference between European sitters and dark-skinned squatters. Mao's statements seem on the surface to harbor the desire to locate essence through the body. But the opposite is the case. Le technique du corps is an affirmation of the power of artifice in all attitudes of the body, a study of the technological education of bodies, which refuses to define technology merely as the instrument of science, speed, and war. Les Techniques du corps describes the way in which bodies are themselves instruments used in an acculturated mechanical process, constrained by social tradition and utility. To emphasize the role of the social in these unconscious repetitive actions of the body, Mao's returns to the Latin word habitus, one he contrasts with the French habitude, habit or custom, which signifies an individual's acquired ability or faculty. In contradistinction, habitus, where the techniques of bodies are located, connotes a structural process which does not vary just with individuals and their limitations and their imitations. They vary especially between societies, educations, proprieties, and fashion, types of prestige. In them, we should see the techniques and work of collective and individual practical reason rather than in the ordinary way, merely the soul and its repetitive faculties. For Mao's, the habits of the body which constitutes techniques are precisely the effect of inhabiting a social enactment of space. The child, the adult, imitates action that have succeeded, which he has been successfully performed. He has seen successfully performed by people in whom he has confidence and who have authority over him. It is precisely this notion of the prestige of the person who performs the ordered, authorized, tested action vis-a-vis -vis the limitation that contains the social element, the imitation action that follows and contains the psychological element and the biological element. The child normally squats we no longer know how to. I believe that this is an absurdity and an inferiority of our racist civilizations, societies. They were squatting, waiting for a bus. In the late 1970s and early 80s, in the city, where, uh, which was one of America's refuge cities for Vietnamese refugees, many of them boat people. They were located after gaining asylum in the US in a city where my brother saw people he took to be Vietnamese at the bus stop. Just as their eyes, oversaturated with the devastation of war, needed to adjust to the panorama of American culture, their displaced bodies needed to negotiate the corrosive space between the alien and the assimilated and learning acceptable ways of presenting themselves. This winter, answering a call from NGBK, the Neuer Gesellschaft for Bildende Kunst in Berlin, for an exhibition of which the subject was the business of violence. I disseminated on the walls of buildings and bus stops throughout the city streets, the image of a slightly less than life-size squatter with his back to the viewer, his face in eclipse, just enough for it to be discerned as non-German multiplied on a thousand we paste it posters.
they talk to other posters around the city. They are ripped and they're edited. One thing I learned in Berlin was that not everybody can squat. So here I help them out. Michael Asher, 1979. The sculpture of George Washington cast in 1917 is a replica of the marble sculpture of 1788 by Jean-Antoine Houdon. In 1925, it was installed in front of the Michigan Avenue entrance of the Art Institute. As my work for the 73rd American Exhibition, June 9 to August 5, 1979, I have moved the sculpture of George Washington into the galleries. The 73rd American Exhibition can be reached by going to the first floor of the Morton Wing. For directions, please ask one of the guards. In this work, I'm interested in the way the sculpture functions when it is viewed in its 18th century context, instead of its prior relationship to the facade of the building, where it has been for 54 years. Once inside Gallery 219, the sculpture can be seen in connection with the ideas of other European works of the same period. By locating the sculpture within its own time frame in Gallery 219, I'm placing it within the framework of a contemporary exhibition through my participation in that exhibition. Simon Lang, 1997. As my work for figure, October 10 to November 19, 1997, I've asked three departments at the Art Institute of Chicago to send me photographs of the sculpture replica by Udon, of Michael Asher's work using the relocation of the sculpture, and of the entrance to the Betty Reimer Gallery of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, the site of this present exhibition. I have made a new image entitled Squatting Project Chicago, based exclusively on these images sent. In 1998, I was invited by the Generali Corporation, which oversees the Generali Foundation in the city of Vienna to make a work for its space. This was under the auspices of an invitation by the artist Matthias Poletna, and included himself, Dorit Margreter, Nils Norman, and me. For my work, I researched the holdings of the General Leaf Corporation in real estate in the city of Vienna. I discovered there were 131 buildings and I squatted in front of every one of them over the course of about two weeks. Taking a photo in front of each. The photographs were hung at a round waist level so that the best viewing vantage point would be for somebody who is already squatting. There are many guest workers in Vienna. Some of them 
are classical musicians. Some of them are artists. One of the buildings was a theater that was putting on the trial by Franz Kafka. Franz Kafka worked for Generali Corporation, the Prague branch, for several months. This is a view of the exhibition. And this is on the other side of the wall. You will see that the building has transformed somewhat because in 2014, the Generali Foundation, which was never a real foundation, but merely the PR wing of Generali Corporation, gave up the space. It is now a supermarket. On the left here, in the liquor section against the wall, I see the words action twice. I don't know this man, but he was hired to perform my work by Pierre Balvon, whole project by Manuel Thomas. There is no need for you to leave the house. Stay at your desk and listen. Don't even listen, just wait. Don't even wait, be completely quiet and alone. The world will offer itself to you to be unmasked. It can do no other, enraptured it will arrive before you. War and Peace in the 70s was made as a type of reflection on a few remnants of the post-68 era that were beginning to gather in my mind in the early 90s. This is a statement from 2011. Warren's biography, a Polish refugee born in a displaced person's camp in Germany, an immigrant child to the US, a deserter from the American army between 1968 to 1975, returning to the US then after, coupled with the 70s atmosphere of PS1, the historical import of his first show rooms, the rumination on the relationship between aesthetic attitude and the real life politics of the 1960s, and certain biological, biographical congruences between Warren and Vito Panchi, facilitate the making of this work in a relatively short order. In retrospect, if I had made War and Peace quickly, it was in no small part because the first Gulf War was fresh on my mind. And Warren stands as a deserter from an earlier war enunciated something with the urgency of necessity. Namely, that desertion is a form of ethos, a transvaluation of pathological patriotism that is all too common in a nation at war. Furthermore, it was through deserted, desertion and exile that Warren became Warren, the multilingual Euro-American sophisticate who for some still performs the spirit of the 60s. Here in this part of War and Peace called Nom de Paix, I trace the pronunciation of Warren's name. Warren being a name he took up while living in exile. 
a name containing a war within. As it progressed from birth through immigration, desertion, exile, and return, to be a deserter, I surmised, was to assume a name, no, non, of peace, non de paix, a no less enabling identity than a non de guerre. Almost two decades after I was the artist in residence at PS1, I made as my work for 91, 92, 93, an exhibition in which Andrea Frazier, Lincoln Tobier, and I returned to our earlier works in the early 90s, Artists in Residence. For six weeks in the Mac Center's Artist Residence apartment, Warren was the artist in residence. From his bed, which remained an archive for the duration of the time. Give the form for sculpture. At the foot of what would be the sleeping section of the bed are two texts. One, a collaboration between us, half of it consisting of all the writings Warren produced in the six months because Warren was deep in a Kafkan phase. The other text is downloaded from the internet, a copy of Kafka's A Hunger Artist. Three of the six monitors beneath the table were made while Warren performed his role as artist in residence. In one, a loop consisted of Kafka's 109 aphorism. It was read over Warren tracing the inner parameters of a circular building on the campus of UC Irvine, known as the Grotowski Group. Twenty eleven WAW CDG NYC LAX. My original name, Yerji, is phonetically close to the word for hedgehog, Yej. And I thought of the famous fragment from the Greek poet. Many a thing knows fox. Hedgehog knows one, the big one. There are no stupid species. But what do I know? What do I know? Cousage questioned the modern fox Montaigne. I seem to know a thing or two, but wonder why unknowingly, ignorant, fighting it. I do what I do, not what I know. In recent decades, interest in hunger artists has markedly diminished. While it used to pay to stage great performance events of that type, today, this is quite impossible. Those were different times. Representation is a rich, rich word uh, because it ties into a whole philosophical uh, structure of representation, perception. Uh, reality as well as an activity it's like a presentation 
in the theater or on television, so-and-so presents. And of course, it's re-presentation. One is always in that, in that knees on a beam, in that great uh, abyss of constantly having to hold it together. Third definitive article for a perpetual peace. The law of world citizenship shall be limited to conditions of universal hospitality. Here, as in the preceding articles, it is not a question of philanthropy, but of life. A's. Everybody thinks they're an ace. We all think we're aces, so we're going to ace this on the first go, but that almost never happens, and it's almost always plan B that works out. It is not the right to be a permanent visitor that one may demand. A special beneficent agreement would be needed in order to give an outsider a right to become a fellow inhabitant for a certain length of time. It is only a right of temporary sojourn, a right to associate which all men have. They have it by virtue of the common possession of the surface of the earth, where, as a globe, they cannot infinitely disperse and hence must finally tolerate the presence of each other. Well, as I say, often they don't inquire, they don't say, well, why are you calling me? Where would you have stayed? Who would you have called if I wasn't? Where would you be if I wasn't at home to take this call? Okay, so these are the keys, and the, the pink ones for the front, front door, door, and you need it for both front doors. Maybe that's what makes a, a real host guest situation, that people don't inquire. It's either possible or it's not, but it's given on, on, a, on a gift basis. Yes, I can take you. He flew over from Moorside. I was escaping from the... Uh, you were just they had an early winter. And then I squeezed in to Charles de Gaulle. And the it's the funny American way of right. opening a door, which is counterintuitive. Popolo, alla riscossa, bandiera rossa, bandiera rossa. Avanti popolo, alla riscossa, bandiera rossa, trionferà. Statement 2011. War after war is, in many ways, made to accompany war and peace, almost 20 years later. Unlike the earlier peace, this has been much longer in the making. Since when? 2003, 4, 5? I can't remember. But I know that I began to think about making new work with Warren when this country entered into a flagrantly endless war. This was because it was around this time that the circumstances in Warren's life had again shifted. For most of the last decade, maybe all of it, Warren has lived the life of a cosmopolitan nomad. Cosmopolitan is cosmopolitan, my word, 
nomad is. Staying with friends across Europe and America after losing his New York apartment and eventually, perhaps almost atavistically, finding a more or less permanent bed in Warsaw. Still, Warsaw being far from the main stage, his travels consequently persisted. And more than a dozen times, I've heard others wonder aloud, especially when war is nigh. But how does he manage to? At times, Warren has been described as a professional guest, but I believe that he might not identify with such or any profession, that he would simply prefer not to. Perhaps what I'm interested in is not so much to dwell on the identities of our, cho of our choosing, say a nomad, but those that are less motivated by choice than are the effects of circumstance. To be constantly on the move is a difficult life. And I'm reminded of how Warren was born a refugee, a displaced person. Is the life of war a skesis or habitus? All the readers of Perpetual Peace were people who had given Warren a bed. As is the case at the Queen's Museum now, all the seating are chairs borrowed from people in New York who had given Warren a bed. November 2019. Dear Warren, your New York family gathered at the Emily Harvey Foundation yesterday. We heard that you began coming to this address, 537 Broadway, in the 1980s when you were still living in Boston, when it was still the Emily Harvey Gallery, and that you sometimes stayed in the little room at the top of the spiral staircase, or when that wasn't available, on a mattress on the floor. Some told of how you're always still with them in their writing. Andre spoke of his two PhD dissertations that you edited, and you haunt all of Krishna's writing in English. Joan reads from your famous emails, and I read some magical morsels of your writing. Or to be more exact, your collage of quotations grafted onto more quotations in ways only you can author. Thierry reminded us that you were on a first name basis with the world. With five pairs of your leather pants in my possession, I thought that leather pants are as good a medium as any for a drawing. The idea was to spell out W-A-W -W with them. But, but upon learning that Jim was bringing a sixth pair, it seemed clear that WWW stood perfectly for Worldwide Warren. Next year in Queens, the leather pants drawing were once again spelled W-A-W to accompany another installation of War After War. I remember buying at least one of those pairs for you and when we took them to the tailor to have them altered, she could not understand who you or what our relationship could possibly be. Who is he? She asked. A friend, I said. Where are you going to be this week? Uh, probably here for a good part of the winter and then like a migratory bird will have to find a, a tropical or subtropical uh, repair for a month or two. Winter is very bad for migratory birds. Here 
as in the preceding articles. It is not a question of philanthropy, but of right. Hospitality means the right of a stranger not to be treated as an enemy when he arrives in the land of another. One may refuse to receive him when this can be done without causing his destruction. But so long as he peacefully occupies his place, one may not treat him with hostility. It is not the right to be a permanent resident that one may demand. A special beneficent agreement will be needed in order to give an outsider a right to become a fellow inhabitant for a certain length of time. It is only a right of temporary sojourn, a right to associate, which all men have. They have it by the virtue of their common possession of the surface of the earth, where, as a globe, they cannot infinitely disperse and hence must finally tolerate the presence of each other. Originally, no one had more right than another to a particular part of the earth. While the surface of the earth is a beautiful thing, it is also time for us to update Kant. The mass die-off of thousands of songbirds in southwestern U.S. was caused by long-term starvation, made worse by unseasonably cold weather, probably linked to the climate crisis. Scientists have said, flycatchers, swallows, and wobblers were among the migratory birds falling out of the sky. In September, with carcasses found in New Mexico, Colorado, Texas, Arizona, and Nebraska. A USGS National Wildlife Health Center necropsy has found 80% of specimens showed typical signs of starvation. A hundred and two years ago, in the decade of our earlier fever, in asking what happens after Nora walks out, Lucien writes, a bird in a cage lacks any kind of freedom. No doubt, but should it leave its cage, danger lurks outside, hawks, cats, and so on. And if it has been shut up for so long that its wings have atrophied or has forgotten how to fly, then truly it has no way out. 20 years later, in 1943, in the novella Jasmine T, Eileen Chang writes, she was not a caged bird, for such a bird could still fly away when the cage is open. She is a bird embroidered on a screen, on a background, on a background of a gloomy bouquet, a white bird against golden cloud patterns. The passing years 
have darkened its plumage. Its screen is eaten by mildew and moths. Even in death, it perishes only on the screen. On Warren's computer, the command key was used so often that the black paint is worn away. Nine keys do not work at all. Nothing appears if you tap on those keys. And I have yet to learn how to navigate around those missing keys. But his erudite mind operated on cutting and pasting. Quotation was his element. It seems that Warren last opened the computer in April 2019, which seemed about right since he died in June. In the months prior, he was too weak to eat, let alone read. Every file sits on the surface of your gaze. I opened one with the title, War After War. There is quote after quote. True or foe, livre coeur, book course. We all have two lives. The real one, the one we have dreamed in our childhood in which we continue to dream as adults through the mist. And the false one, the one we live in our relation to others which is the practical, useful one, the one where we end up being cut into a coffin, put into a coffin. Further down the page, a phrase in Chinese catches my eye. I have already seen death followed by Tin Ha Wat Gong. The world is public. The world is one. So this is where we are and where, where we'll stop. The embroidered bird has not any more strategies, no lines of flight. Its only recourse is to embed into the field to become unreadable. Warren, I'm glad you died when you did. I don't think you can withstand this one. Abstraction is the word we give to something so familiar that it never needed a proper name. Once upon a time, it was easier to like the idea of this thing to admire its logic. The fact that you have this thing that knows nothing, you tell it, and then you tell it to tell you back. Simon, thank you so much um, for all of those provocative ideas and images. Um, I want to welcome everyone to submit questions into the Q&A uh, feature. Um, I'm Sophia Marissa Lucas. I'm an assistant curator at the Queen's Museum. And um, my visual description, um, I am a woman in my 30s. I am a uh, Portuguese American with fair olive skin and brown hair and brown eyes. And today I have my hair pulled back and I'm wearing a black sweater.
if um, to get the conversation started, Simon, maybe you can um, share a little bit about how you approached um, combining these bodies of works together. Um, and also, of course, what you were thinking about in this current moment. Um, uh, yeah, I think I refer to that a little bit in the text in that uh, for many years I was making different bodies of work and the squatting works actually continue in the, the 21st century. Uh, but I, I, for the sake of time, I limited uh, the squatting work to, I think maybe four or five pieces. Uh, and for 27 years, I worked with Warren. Um, and about 10 years ago, I was asked to present something at the Museum of Modern Art. And then I realized that what they have in common my squatting work and my work with Warren was that they were always looking for a place to rest. And that in a sense was the organizing principle around a lecture that I've been thinking about. City of Squatters seemed to be a good place to take that on, but maybe through a slightly different perspective. It's almost as if I'm I feel like I'm always almost looking at myself, you know, askance. And uh, originally, this was going to be a very thorough piece of self appropriation, you know, in that I was going to just read one text from 1995 with my back to the audience, you know, in a sort of durational manner. But of course, so many things happened in the last. Uh, few months <laughs> that uh, it's almost as if every bit of information, everything I read, every new thing I encounter uh, is a part of this atmosphere of seeking refuge, of uh, confinement, of needing to rest. Um, so as you can probably tell, uh, what happened last week found its way into the work. Uh, because this is the atmosphere in which we live in. And so I, I think a lot about how works of art are always in relationship to many, many things with each other, with its time, uh, with different orders of time within the work of art. But the atmospheric dimension of work and of art, I tried to allude to it a little bit earlier, you know, in terms of the time of the work of art, of how a viewer or somebody experiencing it is a part of that experience, that we are the fragment of different orders of time that we try to synchronize ourselves with. Thanks for that. Um, I think I also really liked, I mean, you've spoken so much about your collaboration with Warren and um, I loved how you can sort of continued that collaboration, addressing him directly in the piece. Um, and I don't know if that's more of a comment than a question, but I wanted to kind of highlight that. Um, and um, I also wanted to ask, you know, if you, have thought much about what it means to present this. Um, you're kind of in a state of dislocation from the exhibition itself. You haven't seen it and you're, you know, kind of offering this work um, to, into a context that you haven't physically experienced in this online format. And I wondered if you, you know, how much that impacted your thinking about this. 
it's impacted my thinking tremendously <laughs> because it's impacted my life tremendously. Yeah. I don't, you know, I, I don't really think there's a real separation between how uh, I work as an artist and how I live my life. Mm -hmm. not, not really. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I, I tend to, or have tended to make work for the subjects of my work, you know, so when I make a, an, uh, an artist theater work about a MoMA strike, you know, I, I was making it for the people who were on strike. I was making it for the art workers, you know, for whom this would be relevant. Um, I think that, especially true for my work with, with Warren, we worked for many, many years without a specific goal. You know, we, you know the reason that artists in residence and War After War were made the same year is because in some ways we just divided what we've been doing, what we had been doing for almost a decade into uh, two circumstances which answered to the condition. You know, one was sort of a cyclical med meditation that Warren himself used as a way to look at his life. Mm -hmm. I, I think I told you another time that uh, when it was first shown, Warren in New York, it, Warren would go to the gallery and watch the film, which is 90 minutes long, <laughs> over and over again, day after day. Mm -hmm. So maybe I didn't completely know it, but I made the work for Warren. Mm -hmm. And one thing about the idea of the addressing of the other is I think a lot about how in War After War, he's often depicted as being alone, but he's not alone because I'm actually there. <laughs> right. You know, so in mm -hmm. a sense, I feel and that- You're I, having the same experience now. <laughs> well, I, I, feel, I feel that Warren really needed to be looked at. Mm -hmm. He needed to be looked after. Uh, he needed to be seen. One of the things that I, I like to think about is how uh, that's basically the occupation of a refugee. You need to be seen. Right. And for, uh, for what it's worth, you know, uh, Warren knew that very, very deeply, that he's somebody who for many reasons wanted to be seen, but it was also a need that was deeper than what he can articulate. And so the film did the work for him in a way. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Simon. I think we're going to um, start in the, the questions that have come up. Thank you everyone for your questions. Um, I wanted to start with a question from Ming, um, who says, I really love the use of wordplay. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you think about language in your work? Well, I'm always thinking about several languages, I suppose. Uh, you know, since English is not my first language and I, and I was brought up in a language that is considered a minor language of a uh, more important language. So, so that language that I grew up speaking literally squatted under <laughs> uh, other languages, you know, in terms of its ranking and hierarchy. Um, I think that Sometimes it's easier to write with a script, but I don't think of written language as being 
completely adequate uh, in terms of what I want to do as an artist. And, and when, you know, I, I suppose if I were write a piece of writing, that would be kind of a different thing than if I were giving a talk like this one. I think that oftentimes I use puns, uh, sometimes uh, puns across languages um, as a way to get at something really quickly. You know, so the example that I use because Poe, the piece Poe is being shown at the museum right now is that I worked with Warren to play a Poe character in Warsaw because Warren was living in Poland and Poland is the land of Poe, you know? So, you know, I, I think that many times I work very uh, much just according to the surface or according to the shape of something. Um, so I think of the elasticity of language not merely as a means of communication, but as a sort of uh, uh, self-regulating, uh, neurotical type of activity. You know, so you know, in, in other words, most of most of the language that we use is actually never expressed, you know, and it's and also language is absolutely continuously forever uh, intertextually imbricated with other things. Uh, so I don't have a theory of language, but I know that I, I feel its use and its work uh, mediumistically as, as material. We have another question, which is sort of about how Warren thinks of language from Sina. Um, the word war and the name Warren was clearly important to him in selecting his new name, but do you think he was also interested in the idea of the borough or the Warren, which he would have perhaps thought about as he read Kafka? It is maybe a question of what sort of thinking the Warren affords the animal who lives in one, or maybe he wanted to fashion himself into a sort of Warren. Yes, I think all of those things uh, resonate, but I think at the same time, the idea of choosing something is not exactly uh, tethered to a subject in a subject intention and in action. In other words, uh, it's not so much Warren chooses the name Warren. You know, he, he was born Yerji, grew up as George in America, and he took the name Warren as a deserter from the American army. And he was able to take the, the name Warren because an actor named Warren had changed his name. So in a sense, the name chose him <laughs> rather than the other way around. But if you were to talk to Warren, he would, uh, he would part, he would say something like, what well, isn't it, isn't it uncanny? You know, and I always tell him that he's a magical thinker, but I only tell him he's a magical thinker because I feel like perhaps I'm also a magical thinker. Uh, uh, I just have, um, maybe I have less courage than he does, you know, in terms of making difficult choices. Um, in terms of the many, many different connotations or meanings of Warren, I just say yes to all of them. Yeah. And war, you know, war means warfare. But if I were to say war, it just means I in Mandarin, you know, and Warren and I, because he also knew Chinese, um, 
you know, he and I would sort of work out different ways of, of thinking about his name. Uh, what, I, what I call the nom de pay, you know, it, it comes from a sort of Derridian uh, source uh, in terms of its theoretical basis. The, the name of the father and the no of the father, but it's also just very much like um, how Warren functions, I feel, um, in that he took up something perhaps by accident, perhaps through desertion, but it is the mirror image of something like a nom de guerre. You know, so a des deserter takes a nom de pay that is, in a sense, a reflection of and maybe a renunciation of the nom de guerre. We have another question from David. Um, can you, could you expand on your concluding marks, remarks on abstraction? Ooh, can I expand on it? Um, no, what did I say? <laughs> I thought I would just say what I said. Okay, so this is, this is what I wrote. Abstraction is the word we give to something so familiar that it never needed a proper name. Once upon a time, it was easier to like the idea of this thing, to admire its logic. The fact that you have this thing that knows nothing, you tell it and then you tell it to tell you back. Uh, I think that I was thinking about abstraction in relationship to the grid in, in relationship to structure. Uh, and the reason that I ended with the two metaphors of the two birds uh, is in a way to articulate two things caught in their fields. And I'm thinking about the means through which we are talking right now, meaning through the computer, you know, through what I am in a way suggesting is a modeled abstraction. Uh, so I think that there's a certain degree of intimacy and, and imbricated uh, textual reality that we, or I at least, um, feel like is always on the surface of everything I see. Uh, so, I mean, I suppose in a Lacanian framework, you know, it would be a, like the screen, but of all the things that are named, of all the things that are given proper names, you know, there are a million more that aren't, <laughs> that don't have names. And I, I don't know if they're any less powerful. Uh, I don't know if they exert any less power upon our lives. Those are all the questions that we've had in the chat so far, but I wanna welcome Larissa or Lindsay to ask any other questions or Simon, if you have any other comments or, you know, did anything occur to you as you were finally performing this live perhaps or, um, yeah. If I were to do it tomorrow, it would be a different thing. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I had um, one question sitting um, 
in front of the Unisphere um, that you were showing. Uh, you can't really see it, it's right behind me. I'm at the Queen's Museum. Um, the Unisphere we're referring to is from the 1964 World's Fair, um, which was themed Peace Through Understanding. Um, and I wanna, yeah, I just wanted to ask more about that imagery of the globe of the Unisphere and the way you're incorporating it into this, into this performance. Yeah, um, I was, the, the, the quotation is from the first paragraph of the third definitive article of Perpetual Peace, which I use throughout War After War. Uh, it is generally something that I am in agreement with, although I do have some critiques, you know, of Kant. Uh, I think that, uh, this idea of the surface of the earth where one can, you know, no one has any more claim to any, any part of the earth, any other, because the world is a globe is, is a very powerful idea of how um, in, a, in a way the, um, the movement of people, of refugees, you know, as the third definitive article explicitly talks about, is a natural human right. I think about how the UN Charter, which is based on per perpetual peace, uh, as I understand it, uh, was drafted um, where the museum is. <laughs> Inside the museum, yes. <laughs> so Signed it. Mm -hmm. That's right. So in a sense, I mean, I, I don't know all the history of it, but I, I really sort of feel that uh, that attention and in a sense that legacy, which you know, which should be in all parts of the world diffused um, is somewhat concentrated uh, in this particular spot in Queens. And so uh, the Unisphere, you know, it's, it's, it's the world image that, that is a, fundament, a fundamental form of orientation. Um, but you know, like anything else, it's it's material. I think that that could be a really nice note to end on, Lindsay, Absolutely. in the real, in front of the globe, <laughs> us all elsewhere, um, us all thinking about the state of the world and so on and so on. Um, thank you so much, Simon, for this really touching experience. Yeah, thank you. It, it's been a pleasure working with everybody. And I feel that um, many years talking with Larissa about this uh, has, uh, has been very, very uh, productive and rewarding and enriching for me. And I loved working with everybody, Sophia, Lindsay, Ryan. Um, and I hope to see the show eventually. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> to end on welcoming the stranger. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>